Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's conference call to discuss Stratus' fourth quarter and full year 2020 financial results. My name is Jesse, and I'm your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. And now I'd like to hand the call over to Yona Lloyd, Chief Communications Officer and Vice President of Investor Relations for Stratasys. Mr. Lloyd, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us to discuss our 2020 fourth quarter financial results. On the call with us today are our CEO, Yoav Zaif, and our CFO, Lilach Payorsky. I remind you that access to today's call, including the slide presentation, is available online at the web address provided in our press release. In addition, a replay of today's call, including access to the slide presentation, will also be available and can be accessed through the Investor Relations section of our website. Please note that some of the information you will hear during our discussion today will consist of forward-looking statements including, without limitation, those regarding our expectations as to our future revenue, gross margin, operating expenses, taxes, and other future financial performance, and our expectations for our business outlook. All statements that speak to future performance, events, expectations, or results are forward-looking statements. Actual results or trends could differ materially from our forecast. For risks that could cause actual results to be materially different from those set forth in forward-looking statements, please refer to the risk factors discussed or referenced in Stratasys' annual report on Form 20F for the 2020 year, which we are filing with the SEC today. Please also refer to our Operating and Financial Review and Prospects, which appears as Item 5 in that annual report, as well as the press release that announces our earnings for the fourth quarter of 2020, which is attached as an exhibit to a report on Form 6K that we furnished to the SEC today. In order to obtain updated information throughout the year concerning our quarterly results of operations and the risks and other factors that most impact those results, please see the quarterly earnings press releases and our quarterly operating and financial review and prospects each of which are attached as exhibits to reports on Form 6K that we furnish to the SEC on a quarterly basis over the course of the year. Stratasys assumes no obligation to update any forward-looking statements or information which speak as of their respective dates. As in previous quarters, today's call will include GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures. The non-GAAP financial measures should be read in combination with our GAAP metrics to evaluate our performance. Non-GAAP to GAAP reconciliations are provided in tables in our slide presentation and today's press release. Now I would like to turn the call over to our CEO, Yoav Zaif. Yoav? Thank you, Yona. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It is an exciting time to be a leader in the 3D printing industry. Both our industry and our company are expected to enter a meaningful, sustained trajectory of unprecedented growth in the years ahead. Additive manufacturing is experiencing increased demand from multiple sectors of the global economy, driven by secular change from industrial technology, automotive, healthcare, and many other markets. Industry analysts project a forward five years CAGR in excess of 20%, with continued strong growth well into the end of the decade. Turning to our results for the fourth quarter, we again deliver sequential quarterly improvement in both revenue, up over 11%, and operating cash flow, which was 23.7 million, our highest level since the first quarter of 2018. These are positive indications that we are in the early phases of a recovery from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. As we look ahead, we expect to be able to build on this momentum. At Stratasys, we are well positioned to grow. We have a strong balance sheet with no debt that is set to support future growth. We believe that prudently investing capital back into the business 
will result in meaningful accelerated revenue, earnings, and cash flow in the years ahead. In August, we shared our new strategy to lead the polymer 3D printing market by delivering the most innovative next generation technologies that address the fastest growing manufacturing applications, all while leveraging the strongest go-to-market infrastructure in our industry. We are confident this is the right approach to position us to drive sustained revenue and profitability growth. Manufacturing is by far the largest addressable market. We know firsthand from our existing business that manufacturing applications typically have higher utilization rates than prototyping applications. Manufacturing drives increased recurring revenue from consumables, which results in a higher value opportunity for strategies. We have several key advantages that will help us successfully deliver on our strategy and enhance shareholders' value. This includes the broadest offering with the most advanced, innovative, best-in-class technologies for every step in the customer's product life cycle, from concept through manufacturing. Unmatched market access to a network of over 200 channel partners the largest and most experienced in the industry. Deep application engineering expertise that helps drive innovation. A resilient business model designed to scale and a growing software partner ecosystem to bring important added value to our customer base. Turning to 2020, I want to recognize the hard work and dedication of the entire Stratasys team. As we have worked through the COVID-19 pandemic, our resilient team continues to meet each challenge head-on to create opportunities that have become catalysts for change. As we navigate through the challenging economic environment, we are emerging as an even stronger company. I assumed the role of Chief Executive Officer one year ago, and since that time, we have achieved several important accomplishments, including the implementation of our new strategy around polymers, which is the biggest profit opportunity in 3D printing in our view. Specifically, we aligned our business around delivering the most comprehensive solution for manufacturing applications. The acquisition of Origin, the best-in-class photopolymer solution for production-oriented applications that we believe will be a key growth driver as we pivot to manufacturing solution and enhance our target market. As we have previously communicated, while we plan to deliver the first sales through our channels later this year, Origin is going to be a more meaningful revenue growth driver starting in 2022 and is expected to generate up to 200 million in new annual business by 2025. We are excited about the opportunities that this platform can deliver to the market and the positive impact it should bring to our business. The enhancing of the company's operating model to be application-centric, which creates focus and allows us to better leverage synergies. Cost rationalization that resulted in 30 million of annual run rate savings, enabling us to reinvest in higher profit areas of the business. And finally, the reconstitution of the management team and board of directors to strengthen our leadership and oversight. The opportunity to increase the share of manufacturing within our overall revenue from the production of end-use part is significant. This is a multi-trillion dollar market and we believe 3D printing penetration is in the low single digit today. We are just getting started. Based on our estimates in 2020, we generated more than 25% of our revenue from manufacturing solutions. We believe that the share of our revenue for manufacturing will expand in the coming years as we begin offering our new manufacturing-focused products later this year that include photopolymerization and powder bed fusion. We also expect to add updated versions of our high-end FDM system and healthcare and dental application solutions. We expect this to drive low double-digit growth in manufacturing revenue this year and over 20% annually in the medium to long term. 
We look forward to updating you annually on this metric. Looking at some of the milestones of the fourth quarter, in addition to acquiring Origin in December 2020, we also advanced the development of a powder bed fusion platform through our joint venture with ZAR, which we continue to expect to launch in 2021. We expect this system to provide us entry into an extended set of manufacturing applications beyond what is available with our current system. And we look forward to providing more details soon. We have also made great strides creating a software ecosystem that will help scale additive manufacturing and integrate with our customers' Industry 4.0 initiatives. For example, Anthropology is helping both FDM and Origin customers design parts for advanced manufacturing quickly in ways not possible through traditional manufacturing. Our integration with Keyshot is now helping accelerate adoption of full color, multi-material polyjet 3D printing. And our GraphCAD SDK enables our FDM system to fully participate in the smart integrated factory floor. Two weeks ago, we acquired RPS, a UK-based company with a top quality stereolithography product line that complements our current portfolio. This technology is used for multiple applications, including tooling, jigs and fixtures, investment casting, dental aligners, medical modeling, and design engineering. We aim to be the first choice for polymer additive manufacturing, offering a full suite of solutions that can support the entire product life cycle, from concept to production. With the RPS system in our portfolio, we are able to take advantage of new opportunities to offer more solutions to our customers. We expect our acquisition of RPS to be slightly accretive to revenue and earning by year end. We also recently announced the addition of carbon fiber to the materials available on our award-winning F123 printer series. This offering delivers the strength and lightweight advantages of carbon fiber for tooling and other applications and can be an excellent replacement for heavier and more expensive metal parts now in the more accessible F123 platform. In turn, customers are continuing to express their confidence in strategies. For example, in automotive, as we announced in November, Volkswagen is driving innovation within new vehicle design, thanks to our J850 printers. In consumer electronics, Google is seeing similar benefits for its Jacquard wearable platform. In aerospace, Boeing recently qualified our PEC-based Antero 800NA thermoplastic so that high temperature FDM material can now be used on flight parts. It is the first material from Stratasys qualified by Boeing for use in applications with elevated chemical resistance or fatigue requirements. This ongoing investment and partnerships help reinforce strategies as a leader in the industry and position us to grow for many years to come. To sum up, as we begin 2021, the pandemic continues to pressure the industry and our business. However, we expect pent-up demand to begin emerging in the back half of the year. As we share through 2020, the closing of our customers' offices and factories slowed the utilization of our system, directly impacting the rate of consumable usage and services. But based on the past two quarters of growth, especially in consumables, we are cautiously optimistic that this recovery will continue as we move through 2021. I will now turn the call over to Lilach, who will share the financial results of the quarter. Lilach? Thank you, Yoav, and good morning, everyone. We are pleased to have delivered sequential recovery in the back half of 2020, with growth in revenue, gross margin improvement, and strong cash generation, 
along with inventory reduction. These are good signs that we are experiencing an economic recovery in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we look forward to the future as the macro economy rebuilds in the coming years. For the first quarter, total revenue was $142.4 million and 11.3% sequential increase from the third quarter based on an initial rebound in both systems and consumables across all regions. This compares to $160.2 million for the same period last year, a decline of 11.1% primarily due to the impact of the pandemic. On a constant currency basis, total revenue declined 12.6% versus the fourth quarter of 2019. Product revenue in the fourth quarter was $99.2 million, a decrease of 9% compared to the same period last year, or 10.7% on a constant currency basis. Within product revenue, system revenue decreased 8.3% compared to the same period last year and decreased 9.8% on a constant currency basis. Consumable revenue decreased by 9.6% compared to the same period last year and decreased 11.6% on a constant currency basis. Services revenues were 43.2 million, a decrease of 15.6% compared to the same period last year. On a constant currency basis, service revenues declined 16.6%. We think services revenue, customer support revenue, decreased by 3.7% compared to the same period last year and decreased 5.6% on a constant currency basis. Gap gross margin was 46.4% for the quarter compared to 49.1% for the same period last year. Non-gap gross margin was 49.5% for the quarter compared to 52.4% for the same period last year. Gap gross margin improved sequentially from Q3 by 750 basis points. Non-GAAP gross margin improved by 270 basis points, primarily due to higher amounts of systems and consumables in the sales mix. GAAP operating expenses were 68.5 million, an improvement of 13.4 million, or 16.3%, compared to the same period last year. Non-GAAP operating expenses were 62.2 million, an improvement of 11.6 million, or 15.7%, compared to the same period last year. Non-GAAP operating expense was 43.7% of revenue for the quarter, compared to 46.1% for the same period last year. The improvement in operating expenses was due primarily to the proactive resizing measures we took in the second quarter of 2020. We also continued the cost mitigation efforts related to the pandemic through the balance of 2020, with the entire company working an effective four-day work week. From earning perspective, gap operating loss for the quarter was 2.5 million compared to a loss of 3.3 million for the same period last year. Non-GAAP operating income for the quarter was 8.3 million compared to 10.2 million for the same period last year. GAAP net income for the quarter was 11 million or 20 cents per diluted share compared to net loss of 2.8 million or five cents per diluted share for the same period last year. Non-GAAP net income for the quarter was seven million, or 13 cents per diluted share, compared to 10 million, or 18 cents per diluted share 
in the same period last year. We generated 23.7 million of cash from operation during the first quarter, the highest amount since the first quarter of 2018, as compared to using 3.4 million of cash in the same quarter last year. This was driven by strong collections and reduction in spending and inventory levels. We ended the quarter with 299.1 million in cash, cash equivalents, and short-term deposits, compared to 308.2 million at the end of the third quarter of 2020. We achieved this despite the cash portion of approximately 30 million related to the origin acquisition. We believe we are well positioned to effectively navigate the pandemic and to capitalize on value enhancing market opportunity given our strong balance sheet with no debt, while focusing on cost controls and cash generation. Given the business dynamic and the uncertainty surrounding the timing and the extent of an anticipated recovery from the pandemic, we are providing the following information regarding our outlook. We are encouraged that our current quarter is tracking relatively similar to the first quarter of 2020, with notable positive growth in system sales. Unlike the negative impact of the pandemic on system sales that we saw in the first quarter of 2020. Maintaining relatively flat sales, even without meaningful participation from key sectors like automotive and commercial aerospace, drives our confidence in potential upside as we move through the year. In those two industries, capital spending has not yet returned to pre-COVID levels, and the utilization rate of our consumables in general across the entire business are still lagging due to COVID. Looking ahead, assuming corn consumption trends continue and the impact of the pandemic persists, we expect our second quarter to track growth in the mid-teens compared to the second quarter last year. We expect to provide updated revenue guidance later in the year as we get more clarity around evolving economic conditions. Tending to operating expenses, we made a strategic decision to invest for both the near term and the future by bringing back our team to a full-time schedule starting January 1st. In current costs, ahead of revenue growth expected to be generated from both the recovery of our current business and the launch of our new technologies. With our employee back full time, the associate expense of operating the business to support our growth ramp has also returned. This plus the impact of our acquisition, along with resource allocation decisions made to help offset some of these incremental costs with support of future growth engines will result in 25 million to 30 million in incrementally higher operating costs as compared to 2020, but still below our 2019 costs. We believe that these strategic investments will yield material growth as the new technologies proliferate in the market, which will lead to significant operating leverage. In closing, 2021 will be a year of investment for growth. The combination of these organic investments, along with our recent strategic acquisition, and specifically the focus on manufacturing, positions strategies to deliver substantial revenue and profitability growth in the future. We also expect that most of this future growth will come from manufacturing applications. With that, let me turn the call back over to Yoav for closing remark. Yoav? Thank you, Lilach. I will conclude today's call by noting that we believe the additive manufacturing industry is poised for a period of exceptional growth, and we expect strategies to lead the way in polymer 3D printing. Our internal reorganization, coupled with organic efforts, 
and strategic acquisition like Origin position us to further broaden our leadership and to outperform over the long term. With that, let's open it up for questions. Operator? Thank you. At this time, we will be conducting the question and answer session. We ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. The confirmation tone will indicate that your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your hands up before pressing the star keys. Our first question is coming from the line of Shannon Cross with Cross Research. Please proceed with your question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was curious um, if you can give us a bit more color into what you're hearing from your customers that makes you comfortable about, you know, a second half recovery. And specifically, I'm curious, you know, you've got three new platforms launching this year um, with, without a lot of trade shows or who knows how this is going to work. Um, you know, how confident are you that, you know, there will be a pickup that, that supports it? And then I have a follow-up. Thank you. Hey, Sharon. Uh, thank you for the question. If you have, we feel confident because there was kind of a bottleneck over the last year. We are engaging with our customers. We are there with them. We have constant interaction with them. Once the recovery is there and, and we start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, there is like a whole set of projects that they would like to run. Of course, it's coming also with the impact of their end market, but we are optimistic on this one based on what we received from them and based on the list of projects that they have. And the way we look at it now, we are looking at a linear growth quarter of those quarters. Through the year, linear? Yeah. Okay. And, and is there any particular segment or geography where you're seeing uh, the most opportunity for improvement? We see improvement across the board. Uh, of course, uh, healthcare is much stronger, and we see already the recovery, and in some cases, even higher than uh, initial pre-pandemic sales. And okay. we see improvement going forward in our strongest segments, which are uh, aerospace, automotive, education. And, and geographically, and then that finishes my questions. I would say that uh, all we see recovery on all fronts across different territories, but you know, as we already mentioned last year, Asia, then Europe, and then the U.S. More or less, this is the the sequence. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ananda Barua with Loop Capital Markets. Please proceed with your question. Hi. Good morning, guys. Appreciate you guys taking the question. Congrats on the on the solid results and good start to the year. Um, you have could, just the follow up to Shannon's question. Could you provide any additional context on what the growth trajectory uh, as we move into the second half of the year could look like? I know it's a long ways away, but. In any context would help us frame how you guys are thinking about it would be helpful, and then I have a follow-up. You know, we already mentioned it. I'm happy to repeat. Uh, the way we look at it, Q1 relatively flat, Q2 mid-team, and then H2 where we are uh, planning to launch the new platform. At H2, we see sequential growth. Uh, quite solid sequential growth. Quite solid sequential. Okay. And then um, as we think about these remarks in the, in, the, in the press release just around, uh, you know, sort of let, growth accelerating in 22 and beyond, and you gave the metric about, you know, sort of longer term manufacturing growth north of 20%. Um, could you give us any other context around how, how when you say accelerating 22 and beyond, how you'd like us to come to, to understand that? Um, you know, accelerating, does that mean for manufacturing greater than the 20%? And then what about the rest of the business? Just any context there would be really helpful. Uh, 
given the language in the press release. So we are doing our best to focus ourselves as a company, but also to be sure that we are aligned with the market. And this is why we came with this new metric, uh, which is our share of sales to manufacturing. And we are currently over 25%, and that will be the main growth generator going forward. So we see it uh, this year growing, this year growing in the low uh, double digit, and then above 20%. A year, and you add to it the whole market that is growing. Also, we have you know the strongest in the market in prototyping, and that creates really very clear, strong growth engine for the future that will catalyst our growth. Where manufacturing is leading the way, and the manufacturing is, as you know, it's the uh, the DLP, the new origin portfolio, which is best in class in terms of quality of parts and suitability for manufacturing, and the ZAR uh, 3D platform, that's the SLA platform. So those are the growth engine. We build on our infrastructure to uh, pave the way of the industry into manufacturing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jim Rusciutti with Needham & Company. Please proceed with your question. Hi, right, thank you, um, and thanks for that metric on manufacturing um, in terms of their contribution last year. What would what would that have looked like in 2019? The percentage of your revenue that you were deriving from manufacturing. So, this metric we are following, and we build a methodology to follow it going forward. So we are not sharing anything. Uh, backward looking, but only forward looking, but we think it's a very important metric for the entire industry as a whole as well. I agree. Okay, thank you. Um, just with respect to um, the acquisition on the SLA side, how would you um, maybe uh, contrast the NEO product that they have with your own V650? It sounds like is your your existing SLA printer, uh, is that mainly for prototyping? Is there a bigger opportunity with this acquisition to perhaps get into some more end-use manufacturing applications? We are just complementing our offering. We have a strategy. We are following, following our strategy. Our strategy is to be the first choice, polymer manufacturing for everyone across the whole product life cycle. And since this is our strategy, the SLA and RPS, which is an amazing line of products, are you know suitable for our strategy in polymer. We it complete our offering and uh, it has both large prototyping applications, but a lot of also end use part tooling manufacturing like you know aligners like uh, investment casting, and also significant applications in healthcare, like uh, healthcare, like uh, medical modeling, for example, for large part uh, single material. So it's a full completion of our product line, and we have a clear roadmap: which application, which machine, where we are going. And thank you. Thank you. The next question is coming from Noel Diltz with CIFO. Please proceed with your question. Thanks, and uh, congratulations on a good quarter in a tough environment. Um, my first question, I was hoping you could just expand on how you're thinking about M&A moving forward um, and just touch on, um, you know, the pipeline of opportunities and where you see uh, some opportunity to further complement your, your current offering. Thanks. We have a strategy, and part of the strategy is in organic growth. We have very clear criteria what we are looking for and how to invest and in what to invest, and we keep evaluating potential investments that will maximum the value, maximize the value both for the company and for our shareholders. We are very attractive 
to startups with disruptive technologies because we are bringing the platform and we are bringing the go-to-market and we have the unique ability to show them their time to market. And this is an asset that uh, you rarely find in our industry because we have all those uh, amazing networks globally with experts across the globe and when we are approaching startup, it's not only about the money, it's not only about uh, the cash, it's a lot about the prospect that we are bringing with us. And we also build a whole operating model that will allow us and allowing us right now to integrate those startups. Uh, thank you. And then secondly, I understand, um, you know, the, the higher jump in operating expenses as we look at, at 2021 and things normalize. Could you speak to how you're thinking about some of that leverage moving in 22 and beyond that you referenced? Is there, um, you know, sort of a, a goal or a model that you're looking to target in terms of leverage on operating expenses as you move forward? Thanks. Good morning. Good morning, Noel. Um, it's it's definitely a good question. Uh, we are uh, complementary to what you have mentioned that we have a strong infrastructure from corporate perspective as well as go-to-market perspective that can be easily observed new technologies and new businesses. And we definitely planning to leverage uh, this and leverage uh, and uh, take advantage of scale as we move forward. In 2021, uh, uh, you not necessarily can see that yet because our growth uh, revenue level is not in the level that we still expect due to COVID. But as we go uh, uh, beyond uh, 21 and 22 or 23, uh, while our uh, production uh, application uh, revenue will grow, we will be able to leverage on that. Uh, we are not providing any specific uh, metrics, but we do expect to see much more profitability uh, going forward. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. The next question comes from Greg Palm with Craig Hallam Capital Group. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, I, I guess just starting, um, you know, the, the guidance commentary is, you know, very helpful, but, you know, specifically for Q2, it implies just slight revenue growth over Q1. Normally, you see a much bigger jump sequentially from Q1 to Q2. And I guess I would think this year, based on your commentary, it might be disproportionately high, just sort of given where we are in, in, in recovery. So I don't know, maybe it's just timing related, you know, your thoughts about the, the second half uh, being stronger. But can you just help us understand why you're not expecting better growth sequentially in Q2? Good morning, Greg. The numbers do uh, present a relatively uh, low sequential compared to Q1, uh, and we, uh, but we are definitely encouraged with the sequential growth that we saw, we saw in Q4 and the strong uh, rebound of hardware that we're going to see in uh, Q1. And what we expect also in the second quarter is continue to see this growth remind you that COVID is still here, okay? It's not that we actually fall back with all our end market. Our in, the industry that are much more affected is the auto and the commercial aerospace. So we're cautiously optimistic uh, regarding the future, and that's why we believe that to be um, a cautiously optimistic now is provide mid-team uh, for next year, uh, for next year, uh, uh, for the second quarter as compared to last year, but as, as the, the economic recover, we will come back and provide a better projection. Yep, okay, understood. And, you know, maybe just a little bit more commentary on origin would be helpful. You know, I'm just kind of curious what the what the feedback's been from kind of the, the customer base, from sort of the resellers, and if we look ahead, I mean, if you're successful in generating the, the $200 million of, you know, annual business, what's the cadence of that contribution look like, 
you know, maybe starting, you know, next year um, up until 25, which I think is the timeline you provided so far. Great question. Thank you. Uh, the first thing that happened after we announced about the origin acquisition, I opened my email box and I received two emails from two important customers complimenting us for the acquisition and asking for a call. I know it's an anecdote, but this is the reflection of what's going out there. We are going to manufacturing. Origin is already being perceived as a leading next generation DLP platform focusing on manufacturing. They have installed base. They have machines out there supporting manufacturing with an ecosystem of materials. And the moment they join forces with strategies and our infrastructure, our customers, and also new logos, what we call, are perceived as a big opportunity to advance manufacturing. So this is the overall perspective. In terms of revenues, we are going to launch the platform at the second half of the year, and we are very optimistic. Okay. All right. I'll hop back into you. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Wamasi Mohan with Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Please proceed with your question. Hi. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, you're, you're saying that the industry is entering an inflection point, uh, typically in, in, in tech markets. Inflection is driven by you know, some change in, in technology, whether it is speed or quality or availability of materials. What, what actually is changing in what your customers are doing that's giving you this confidence in surge in manufacturing? I mean, you noted Origin's portfolio is very good with DLP, but DLPs are being around for a long time. They have an install base. So what, what is it that you think? Is this more about distribution of technology from your perspective, or do you think that there's something more fundamental, especially if this is an industry call on on you know how how there is such a such a large inflection in in growth rates for manufacturing applications and I have a follow up I would say that it's a combination we are in a inflection point because of few very important factors one the technology today is not similar to to, to the technology 5 years ago also in DLP DLP is a great example when you get into the details of the technology the speed the accuracy, and mainly the materials, it's a different ballgame. So this is a great example, but it's relevant for the entire industry. So the technology is ready to start stepping into manufacturing. That's a big change. The second one is the realism of so many manufacturers out there. Post-pandemic, we need to create versatility. We need localization. We need to make sure that we have flexibility and first response and ability really to face weather crisis, pandemic, the ability to localize things, not to have inventory. So this promise is currently brought to life. So this is the second change. And we are engaging with it, and it's very, very tangible in every discussion that I have with the customer. And thirdly, there is this issue of shifting into new products, new offerings. For example, electric vehicles. You need weight. The reducing weight is critical for the range of the battery, for everything there. And the manufacturers are looking for new ways of producing power. And you can produce parts with additive manufacturing, geometries, mechanical properties, etc., that were not possible in the past. For example, moving from metal to carbon fiber and composites for the sake of weight. So if you take those three, and there are many others, but if you take those three, stronger, much better technology with the strong realism that 
supply chain can be broken and we need to react, plus the tech changes all over the world that require new parts, new geometries, new way of thinking about the physical aspects of products that create together an inflection point. Okay, thanks. You uh, appreciate the color there. Uh, if I would follow up, um, there are some of your competitors out there uh, that claim that manufacturing is really much more centered uh, around metals versus what you just spoke about uh, the shift to shift to carbon fiber. Say, um, you know, in your in your uh, best guess on sort of what the addressable market splits are for manufacturing, how much would you say is manufacturing that would be subsumed by the metals? Additive manufacturing versus versus polymer, and and thanks for giving the split of the 25% of revenue for manufacturing. How's that split between product materials and services? Thank you. Uh, we are not uh, analysts here on this one, and we are focusing on polymer. And I can be very sure. Of course, I can quote many analysts and many uh, different studies that. Uh, address your question, but you can read it better than me. In general, today, when you look at hardware for sure, and also going forward, we are talking about 70%, around 70% polymer and 30% metal. This is in terms of revenue hardware, so for example. Going forward, polymer is expected to grow a bit faster than metal, which was not the case in the last five years, because many people experience metal. But there is one clear trend. Metal parts are being replaced with polymer parts and not vice versa. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Troy Jensen with Lake Street Capital. Please proceed with your question. Hey, uh, Ken, congrats on the great results. Um, I just want to follow up on Jim's question from earlier regarding the V650, um, or, excuse me, the uh, you know the RPS acquisition, the element, and how it relates to V650. I think that strategy, V650, was an open platform on the materials. I'm just curious if RPS and element are going to be closed proprietary, and you know how much of the materials that they generate or that they use are, are internally manufactured versus partnered. Hey, Troy, good to hear from you. And uh, yes, very simple answer. It's going to be an open platform, but we are going to develop new materials, uh, unique materials in partnership with third parties, or actually with the largest material companies in the world. We are working on it, and it's going to be an open uh, material system uh, what we call hybrid material models. All right, understood. And then uh, just to follow up, I know you're launching three new um, platforms here, ZAR, Element, RPS. Can you just talk about organic product development? And, you know, historically you've shown a, an aluminum product and, um, you know, you had others kind of in development. But, you know, can we expect to see some internally developed products from Stratasys also? Yes, for sure. We are keep investing in our business. We are building pipelines. Sorry, you wanted to ask something? I was just going to say new tech, new platforms, or just enhancements of existing platforms? Both. 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 Right, perfect. For example, in Polyjet, we just launched the J55, but this is a platform, so you will see shortly extension to this product line for different segments. We get... You know, this is an amazing machine in terms of reliability, in terms of quality of printing, in terms of uh, mean time between failure. It's, it's really unique, best in class, with uh, features and value to the customers that no one has. And we are keep investing in this platform. You'll see extension, uh, bigger, smaller, uh, different segments, etc. FDM. We are going for manufacturing. This is the, the core strength of Stratasys. This is 
you know, our core position in manufacturing is in FDM, and we are leveraging this position because we understand the need, we understand the ESOs, we understand the regulation, we understand the reliability, the service, and we are building uh, the ultimate manufacturing machine in FDM for end use power. And we are investing in it, and you will see it in the future. Well, good luck this year. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Brian Drab with William Blair. Please proceed with your question. Hi, thank you for taking my questions. Um, I may have missed this because I was forced to join late today, but could you define um, exactly what we're talking about when we say manufacturing revenue, and does that include uh, fixtures, tooling, and, and other things used within a manufacturing environment, as well as end-use parts? And uh, if, you, if you are talking about end-use parts, could you give any specific examples of, of types of parts we're talking about? The answer is yes. It's including everything which can be under the umbrella of end-use parts. So tooling is something people are using. So, you know, the everything, like uh, parts for robots, dental, a line, everything that is being used and it's not a prototype, from our perspective, is manufacturing. So, you know, you can take any example for aero, cabin parts, or uh, other parts for aero, automotive, electric vehicle parts, tooling for uh, robots, carbon fiber for any heavy duty uh, tools or jigs and fixtures, medical modeling that we are doing with our polyjet. We have the most unique capabilities of multi-material, multi-color, to simulate real organs with our DAP, digital anatomic printing. This is also end-use part. So our definition is end-use part. Got it. Yeah, that's helpful. And then um, I just want to clarify, I, I, I didn't fully un understand the, the answer or, or, or didn't follow, but specifically for origin, um, will that – be maintained as an open materials or hybrid materials model as well as RP? Yes, hybrid model like we announced uh, in December. It's going to be a hybrid material model combining our material, partners' material, and also the ability to use the machines for research and development of new materials. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We have reached the end of our question and answer session, so I'd like to turn the floor back over to Yoa for any additional closing comments. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe and healthy. Looking forward to updating you again next quarter. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's teleconference and webcast. We thank you for your participation, and you may disconnect your lines at this time.